Hey, Washington Warhawks coming at you with KFL. I'd like to welcome everyone. We're about to get started with John Odenkirk. He's going to talk about the current black bass species in Northern Virginia right after this. <laughs> He broke me off! Good! Uh, oh, there's one right now. Where are we? Oh my god. Oh my god. If that ever stops playing, I think we're good now. Hey, welcome to the Warhawk Nation tonight. We're going to be talking with John Unkirk, the lead fisheries biologist for Northern Virginia. On the line right now, we've got KFL Commissioner Greg Nozar, General Manager for Three Bells, Lauren Fury. Lauren, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me on, Jim. Some other team members here real quick before we get to you, John. Greg, how are you doing tonight? Doing good, man. Doing good. Outstanding. So we got Joe, we got John on. I think James is also in here. So one thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to watch and monitor the comments going on. I think we have a little bit of a lag when it comes to what I'm saying and what I hear through my turn. We happen to step up when it comes to uh, interruptions. Please forgive us. All right, back around the room. I'm not going to have this many faces up on the screen while John is talking, so I'm going to give John the the. Uh, I'm going to give him the main screen in just one second. John, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us and give us an update on what's going on with our black bass species in Northern Virginia. All right, is that it? I, I'm I'm starting to talk now. <laughs> Once I don't know. I just wanted to welcome you. What we're going to do is uh, back off on how many people we have in the room, but I just want to give you a help on who your audience is right now with the Warhawks because you're talking to the Warhawk Nation. All good, man. Once I start talking, though, I can't stop. So you tell me <laughs> when to go. <laughs> That's all good. It's all good. All right, guys. So uh, just so we have a lot more uh, visibility with John, I'm going to do it for some of the guys from the room real quick. It's in no certain order. I'm just kind of counting down while I do this. Forgive me. If you need to uh, be brought back, and obviously you can put yourself back in the in the chat, right, guys? If you have a question, please, by all means. So I'm going to give you, hang on one second. I'm going to remove you. And John, I'm going to go ahead and... Actually, I'm going to keep that up. And I'm, would you like me to go ahead and uh, why don't you go ahead and start with an introduction, background, all the good stuff, and then uh, we can go ahead and roll right into the first set of slides, if you don't mind, bud. All right. Yeah, sure. So uh, some of y'all are new faces for me, which is great. Always happy to meet new people. Um, I've been working for what used to be when I first came here, we were the commission of the department the, we were the commission of game and inland fisheries. And then we're in the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and now we're a Department of Wildlife Resources. 
So I've been here through three name changes, which probably is representative of how long I've been here, which is longer than I care to admit. Um, I, I've worked in the same district since I came back home uh, from Florida. After I, I, I'm an undergraduate in fisheries from Virginia Tech, and I have a graduate degree in, from Tennessee Tech in fisheries. And then I went to Florida uh, right out of grad school and worked with the feds, the Fish and Wildlife Service on sturgeon and striped bass in Florida and the panhandle. And probably the best career move I ever made was getting out of the feds and coming back to the state where I'd worked as an hourly when I was an undergrad at tech. And I have, haven't moved since I came back from Florida. Uh, I've been in the exact same position that I, I came back for, um, which is pretty neat because I'm still doing my thing. I've still got my district, my boats, my truck and, and, I'm sort of below the bureaucracy S storm. And, uh, and that's why I got into this in the first place, you know, and a lot of my peers have climbed up and they're managing or even running agencies now. And, and um, some of them are having fun and some of them aren't, but, but I'm still having fun and I really enjoy what I do, which is why I'm still doing it. And, and I'm, I work for you all, you know, you buy the license and, and so you're my constituent and I want to hear your perspectives. I want to hear what you think. And um, we're still a hook and bullet agency. We're not getting general fund revenues like a lot of different state game and fish agencies across the country might be. So we're still I'm still beholden extremely to our sportsmen and women. Um, you're the ones paying the bill. You, you're you're allowing me to go to work and and. And as a steward of the resource, I work for you. And so there's two things that I'm concerned about. One is making you happy. And two is conserving our natural resources for future generations. And typically those things overlap pretty well. Occasionally they don't. And that's when we have to make some decisions. But overall, it's a pretty easy job when it comes to things like that. So thank you for supporting me and our agency. And, and um, in terms of where I work, I'm I work out of Fredericksburg, which used to be a regional office back in the day. And then we had a couple board members that were trying to downsize our agency. So they eliminated Fredericksburg as a regional headquarters and combined our area with region four, which we're now still in region four because we got swallowed up by them. Uh, and our headquarters is in the valley in Stanton or Verona, Virginia. Uh, so we've got our, we've got the largest region in the state now because we're really two regions and we just call it region four east and region four west. So I'm region four east. Our district office or our field office is still Fredericksburg. So they didn't achieve their goal of uh, eliminating that lease space uh, because we still had somewhere that we needed to put our boats and our nets and all our crap. So anyway, um, that was a short sighted bureaucratic move that didn't work out so well. But uh, I go as far south as Lake Anna. That's one of my major resources that I spend a lot of time on. And I go as far west as Skyline Drive, which is nice because that gives me um, about 10 counties or so with a true diversity of resources. It's amazing. One day I might be working on native brook trout, uh, you know, in Madison County right off National Park. And the next day I'm on the tidal Rappahannock or the tidal Potomac Tribs and I'm working with snakeheads or largemouth or stripers or American shad or something like that. So um, it's, it's a really, really cool area to work. And I'm really, really get, glad and, and just, uh, you know, amazed to have been uh, awarded this, this, this cherry and, and continue to ride, you know, and enjoy the life. So what I've got for you all tonight is uh, I invited Jim along on a show I did about a week ago with a club called New Horizons Bass Anglers, Charlie Taylor's group. They do a lot of youth outreach and stuff like that. And uh, so I invited Jim along and, and he, I guess he was impressed enough with the information I was uh, relaying to those folks that he wanted me to, you know, try to give some of that to you all, which I agreed to do gladly. And so essentially I'm, I, I have a few PowerPoint slides that I'm going to go back through and just cherry pick uh, here and there to try to give you some information that I think you'll be interested in. And, and hopefully to steer you to maybe more productive angling opportunities and also hopefully to enlighten you about, you know, a, a few things, whether it's typically regards to snakeheads or Alabama bass, things like that. Um, so Jim has brought up the, the first, this, this is a slide that we had prepared. Hey, hey, John, 
last month with a group called CBAV, which is Concerned Bass Anglers of Virginia. You may or may not have heard of them. It's spearheaded by a guy named Bruce Lee, who's a tournament angler uh, in the Rappahannock area downstream of Fredericksburg. And then Chris McCotter was active on this early on. Uh, years back, decades ago, this was brought up to us through um, successive failures of spawning, what we call year class failures in tidal rivers due to droughts and floods that just destroyed the populations at the time. This is, I'm talking back around 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, really bad, hard times for bass fishing in our tidal rivers then due to the aforementioned um, uh, fronts. And so uh, we got on the CBAB's radar at that point, or they got on our radar at that point because of a mutual uh, concern about the, the status of largemouth fisheries in our tidal rivers. And that's when we started looking deeply into how these tidal rivers function, because up until that point, we hadn't spent a lot of time in tidal rivers. We were really busy in small lakes, what we call small impoundments, lakes like Lake Brittle, Lake Manassas, when it used to be open to the public, um, um, Burke Lake, things like that, Occoquan even, which is not, that's, that's just over the line, it's considered a, a large impoundment, but um, we hadn't spent a lot of time on, on tidal rivers. And, and so we were beginning to build a database on what was happening in these tidal rivers right around early 2000s. Um, and, and in fact, in 2000, you can start with the slides, Jim. In 2004, when snakeheads showed up in the tidal Potomac River was when we really, really, really started to look hard at those populations. Um, this is, I don't know if this is an extreme kayak angler, a guy named, oh my God, don't tell me I'm going to forget his name right now. He, I love this guy. He, he came with me on a snakehead symposium. He represented recreational anglers in the snakehead symposium that we had in Alexandria International Symposium in 19, oh no, excuse me, 2019, 2019, John Levitt. Um, so if, if y'all have ever heard of him, he is, he is a, the supreme snakehead and bass kayak angler. Um, I'm sure not as good as you all, but he's really he's really good. He's a nice guy. Anyway, that's John Levitt, and that's in the Rappahannock. And he, I believe him, he told me he caught on three consecutive casts, he caught a, a largemouth bass, a bowfin, and a snakehead. So that's pretty damn cool no matter how you slice it or who you are. Um, but you can go on to the next slide, Jim. Part of the reason I had this slides in is because I've actually got some pictures of fish or aquatic vegetation or pretty river pictures instead of just graphs, which are pretty boring. So I like to break it up a little bit. Um, all right, so, yeah, okay, this is Margie's version that, uh, sorry about the needs editing thing. What I wanted to do here, it, you can't see my cursor, can you, Jim? Does my cursor show up? No? Okay. Um, only thing I want, the distinction I wanted to make here was we're, we're region four. And so this is, we're talking about Rappahannock right now. And so we started sampling the Rappahannock in 2003. And that was after the sky is falling, woo days. I mean, people came to our boardroom and they were screaming bloody murder. So we had to get out and figure out what was happening. So we started collecting data on the tidal Rappahannock in 2003. And we've every year until now, we've done it. And this is six sites on the main river, not tributaries like on the Potomac, because we don't own the Potomac. But this is the main river site. And we sample in the fall here. We would. We would like to sample everything in the spring if we can between about the third week of April and the first week of May. The problem is we've got too many waters with 10 counties to sample in that time window. So the fall is pretty much almost as good as the spring uh, for sampling. So at that point in 2003, when we started sampling the tidal Rappahannock, we had to add, we had to fit that sampling in somewhere and it couldn't be in the spring. So we decided to do it in the fall. So we do that in the late September which is, like I said, almost as good as a uh, spring sample. Go ahead, Jim. For those of you that aren't familiar with an electrofishing rig, this is a pretty standard outlook of what it's like. Uh, the, the, the finger, the boom things hanging off the front are called anodes. Those are the positives. The boat itself is wired to be the negative or the cathode. And so there's a DC current powered by a 5,000 watt Honda generator that runs back into the pulse box, which makes it pulse DC instead of AC current, which is nicer to the fish. And it, it creates uh, electron flow towards the anode 
and the fish are immobilized and, and kind of just pulled. It's, it's a forced swimming motion uh, where, they, where they're oriented towards the anode, where it's easy to pick them up with a dip net and put them in the live well. This is our primary collection technique. It works very, very well in most waters, except when they get too high in salinity. And for us, too high is small salinity, like two or three parts per thousand salinity, and we can't shock. Uh, the, the boats and the gear, the, the, the equipment down in region one, which is downstream of Port Royal, that's as far south as I go on the Rappahannock. They use a different setup, a different box, because they get into higher connectivities than we do because of the salinity wedge. We don't have to worry about that in almost 99% of cases unless we're in a big drought. Uh, so we, we use a standard setup that we've used uh, for the past 30 years on these systems. Um, anyway, I think that's all I need to cover on the electrofish and boat, Jim. What I wanted to show you here, and, and and we're starting off at the Rappahannock, but I'm gonna come around to the Potomac soon, which probably is a water more known to you. But if you haven't fished a lot on the Rappahannock, either for competition or for just pure recreation, I encourage you to do so, because as these linear regressions would demonstrate, the bass population on the tidal Rappahannock has gotten significantly and astoundingly better since we first started looking in 2003. The left-hand graph is fingerling catch rate of electrofishing time, whereas the right-hand graph is adult catch rate of fishing electrofishing time. CPE just simply stands for catch per effort. So the y-axis is different in both these graphs. The 30 fish per hour on fingerlings is, of course, less because fingerlings is a smaller sample set than adults would be because adults are multiple year classes and fingerlings just one year class. But what you can see is that fingerling catch rate has significantly increased. Um, it, it make, it's hard to make up data this, this precise uh, over time. And, and so all this is reflecting, this is just a regression simply of catch rate versus year. Uh, and the amazing thing is that these R squared values are so high, suggesting that just simply time or the year that we collect data are influencing the abundance of bass. And again, this is extraordinary because it, all it tells us that it, with each passing year, there's more bass, which is like you kind of scratch your head and you're like, you know, what the hell? How is this possible? And, and, and I don't know. I can't explain it completely. But what I would submit is that what we have seen anecdotally, we don't measure aquatic vegetation in the tidal Rappahannock and it's nowhere near as abundant as aquatic vegetation in the tidal Potomac. But Aquatic vegetation in the main stem Rappahannock has gone from nothing in my entire career to within the past maybe four or five years, substantial. Uh, and so I would submit that once we get more SAV, we're going to have better year classes. That's the graph on the left, better survival of young fish and therefore better survival of adult fish, which is the bar on the, the graph on the right. Uh, and this is all again, um, the pretext is that we had awful production and populations for five years around 2000. So essentially we're starting from ground zero. We couldn't have started from a worse place, which kind of plays into making this thing look rosy and nice, but it does look rosy and nice um, when you start out from pretty much shit. So, so that's where we are on the Rappahannock River with our bass populations. And if you look at the last four years on the right graph, we're up around 50 to 60 bass an hour of adults. Okay, when you combine the young fish into there, we're pushing 100 fish an hour. That rivals anything we've seen in reservoirs or rivers anywhere in my district or the state, for that matter. So the Rappahannock River right now, especially that section of river below Fredericksburg and really close to Port Royal, like think Hicks Landing or Hop Yard Landing, that's a really, really good place to fish right now. You can put your kayak in at Hop Yard Landing and essentially paddle across the river and a little bit to the right and not go anywhere else and just fish there for four or five hours. And, and you're going to have a really good time for whatever reason. When people put a boat in at the ramp at hop yard, they feel like they got to run up river. They got to run down river uh, that, you know, all the weigh-ins are down at Hicks. So it's not even like people are weighing in fish at hop yard and releasing them, but because that strip of SAV and the main stem extends up from the hop yard, better part of a mile on that straightaway on the far bank, it's absolutely phenomenal. So I would encourage you to check that out. All right, Jim, that's good on that slide. 
Hey, I do have a question for you, John, related to the graphs. You were talking about the, the young, the fingerlings, and also the adults. What separates the two? Is it by weight, by length? And uh, what are those lengths or those measures? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Jim. Thanks for that. So normally, um, when you hear of a, a young, uh, what people call it a, a YOY index, which stands for young of the year, or a juvenile index in fisheries recruitment, you hear a striped bass, you hear that a lot about a lot with a saning haul. How many young a year did they get? What's the recruitment index? With us, we, we don't, we're not out normally because of gear bias and because of the time that we're out there, we're not collecting actual physical young of the year, but we're collecting juveniles. And so what we're considering is a juvenile bass is anything less than eight inches or 200 millimeters, uh, which is a realistic assumption. And meaning that fish we call a fingerling, and that was either depending on when we're out collecting. That normally we're out in on the Potomac, we're out in the spring, so that fish is almost a year old, but not quite a year old. Uh, so it, we essentially lag our catch rates for one year. In the Rappahannock, we it is almost a true young of year index. So th this fingerling catch per effort graph is is marginally more meaningful than the Potomac graph because it is actual young of year index. So these fingerlings are kind of different from Potomac fingerlings, meaning these fingerlings are what we call age zeros or young of the years in true form versus the Potomac fish, which are basically age ones. So when we collect an abundance of, of, of fingerlings in 2003 this year, that's going to reflect last year's year class, 2002 year class. So we have to lag that year, but not in the not in this case on the Rappahannock. Did, did that make sense or did I confuse you? It did. No, not at all. Okay. You want to move on to no? Yeah, it was a, a very uh, very. Do you want to go ahead and move on to the next slide? Yeah, that might uh, be the, the last slide, slide for that. So yeah, go ahead and bring up the um. Yep. The, yeah, exactly. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, different kind of graph. Any questions out there from anyone in the... You know, if, yeah, I'm sorry. If anybody has any questions about the wrap and that stuff I presented, ask, please ask. Hey, John, it's Greg. Hey, I got a question. So I, I've, I don't know, if, have you guys so done studies the of... And... Have you guys done studies above the, um, like the Kelly's Ford area for small mouths? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've done a lot. That's a whole different sort of project that we work on. Unfortunately, this year, we, we normally we normally do four samples there every year. Mm -hmm. We do Ely's Ford, Kelly's Ford, uh, Clore Brothers or Mott's Landing, whatever you want to call it. And we do a site um, right along the Fredericksburg Wayside area we call Embry Dam, which was actually below where Embry Dam used to be. Mm -hmm. This year, we got none of those done because of drought. We could not get our right. road into any of those four sites. So I have zero update on the status of smallmouth. Other than what we've known the last few years, it's hurting a bit um, because of spring flows. At, tidal fisheries are complex. Non-tidal fisheries are much easier to understand and model. And we published a paper 20 years ago on smallmouth in the Shenandoah, James, and Rappahannock demonstrating that almost all the recruitment is driven by June flows. If you have a good June flow, when I say good, I mean close to normal, you get a good year class. It's the Goldilocks principle. If you get too much rain, it sucks. If you get too little rain, it sucks. Um, and, and so we were able to demonstrate, I, I talked about the R squares explaining so much of that variability. With just that one, we had to fight with the editors because they couldn't believe it was possible in a recruitment model that we could explain so much of the annual variation of like 15 years of data with one variable. And that was simply median June flow. And we tied like 80 to 90 percent, depending on the river, of the recruitment variability on that one variable. And, and eventually we convinced them and that, that study was published, I think, in 2005. Um, but suffice it to say that that's how important river flow is to smallmouth bass in determining your class strength. And if your year class strength sucks one year, OK, that's not bad. If it sucks two out of three years, that's going to be a problem four years down the road. And if it sucks like four out of six years, like it has recently for us, then you're going to have some pretty bad fishing for a while. Uh, and that's why we're trying to figure out how to supplementally stock smallmouth in some of these rivers. The problem is production. Well, and that's, figured out. that's I, I've fished that stretch for, I mean, all my life. And ever since they blew up the dam, I've seen a dramatic decrease in, in the quality as well as quantity of fish um, in smallmouths in that area. I, I just... 
it didn't it didn't register to me. I mean, you know, we would catch citations, I mean, nonstop, right? Mm -hmm. And then when they blew up the dam, I don't know if they went south or if they're, you know, if they're intermingled or if like maybe the salinity came up the river. I, I don't know. It's there's some there's something that's changed to that fishery for sure. There's certainly no absolutes in science or fisheries or nature, but but I would comfort you in saying I, I think the changes that you've seen in the smallmouth fishery have nothing to do with the demise of Embry Dam. In fact, what we saw after Embry Dam came out due to the influx of gizzard shad and other forage species moving above the old site of Embry was that smallmouth bass had significantly, the, the growth had increased substantially for every year. Every, every length and age for a year class was greater than it had been to prior to Embry's come down. Mm -hmm. um, so that we, we, we derive that as a positive. I think it's coincidental that post Emory coincided with a lot of these either really high or really low flows resulting in poor recruitment. So I think it was more coincidental that the crashing of the smallmouth fishery than had anything to do with Embry. What size is a fingerling, um, a, a year old bass in, in, in the Rappahannock or Potomac? What, what size lengthwise? Is, is smallmouth that? or largemouth? Large, largemouth. Lar, lar, eight, eight inches. It, it is, is. Okay. what we consider let, let it's once it's eight inches, it's considered an adult and it's recruited to the population. And generally in the tidal river, the Potomac's more fertile than the Rappahannock, but generally that's about a year old and that's really good growth. You're not going to see that growth in most of your lakes, but in the, in the tidal rivers, they tend to grow fast. Yeah. So eight inches is a realistic break. It's funny. I was talking to a, I was talking to a, um, a fisherman who like me has been fishing the Potomac river forever and we felt this fall on the potomac was the best fishing ever in, in in our lives i don't know what clicked on but it was absolutely incredible i mean between like late september through november or you know basically the first week in november i don't know what all of a sudden happened but it has it, it literally it was incredible the fishing that we had it was awesome i'm glad i'm very glad you had that um, and I'm about to get into some of the, uh, you know, we don't survey the Potomac per se because it's Maryland water, but we do, we do a lot of the creeks and we study four creeks every year. And we have since 2004 when Snakehead showed up. Yeah. And so those are the slides I'm about, about to get into now. Yeah, this was a quiet Creek and it was absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Aquia is looking damn good. And you'll yeah. see that here shortly, but yeah, I'm glad you had some good times out there. Yeah. So that, the four creeks that we study every year and we add, we have some outliers, you know, one year, we'll, a couple of years, we'll do Quantico or Powell's or Occoquan or we'll mix some in. But every single year for snakes and bass, we do Little Hunting, Dogue, Pohick and Aquia. And, and that's sort of we use that synthesis to gauge the overall health of our Potomac tributaries with those others I mentioned. But 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 every year. We do these. And, and when I say we do these in April and May, we do trips to these four creeks uh, for bass. And then in March through September, we do the same trips for snakeheads. And, and that's because the gear bias, as I mentioned, you know, we're not going to collect a representative sample of bass in July uh, in three or four feet of water. And, and that's the limitation of electrofishing is typically you know, three or four feet. So we have to conduct our surveys when we have a minimal amount of bias, which is what we try to do. And so the next few slides I'm going to show you are our catch rates of electrofishing. Oh, go back one, Jim. Sorry. Start with Little Hunting Creek and notice the Y axis. OK, we're on the Rappahannock River. Now, this is total. This is catch per unit effort or catch per effort total. So this is a combination of fingerlings and adults. Uh, but what I wanted to demonstrate was the cyclic nature of uh, bass populations, and in, in, especially in tidal rivers. Tidal rivers are a harsh place to make a living. They're not cushy like a reservoir. Reservoirs typically have very stable water levels. Uh, the productivity is fairly stable. You don't have to put up with extremes uh, like, like floods and, and droughts and salinity intrusion, destroying aquatic vegetation and things like that. Uh, and so what we've seen at Little Hunting Creek is highly variable catch rates in, on bass, which is, I think is largely due to highly variable recruitment on bass. Uh, also, in Little Hunting Creek, we have completely lost SAV. We still have spatter dock, which we consider an emergent plant, but SAV, whether it's hydrilla, 
or milfoil. Well, had, Little Honey never had milfoil. It had a lot of hydrilla a long time ago, and it's gone. And it's been gone for a while. Um, so what we've seen at Little Honey is sort of a, a, a cyclic, kind of not a great uh, bass fishery. I, it's a no-wake zone. Well, of course, for you all, it doesn't matter because you're in kayaks, but there's no good public access close to it unless you drag your kayak over Mount Vernon Parkway, which some people do. But I wouldn't necessarily encourage you to take your, your kayaks into Little Hunting Creek because it's just not that productive anymore. It's not that good. But um, the next creek, Doe Creek, downstream along Fort Belvoir, is a very similar creek. Um, if you have that slide, Jim. Doe Creek, also, I think the y-axis goes up to 150 fish per hour. And we've seen a very similar, somewhat similar cyclic, but I guess lately it's been a little bit more stable, but still not what you'd expect for total fish per hour in a Potomac system. We're about 60 fish an hour. Um, if you do go to Doe Creek, I, I would exclusively fish the Fort Belvoir Marina area, which is where the, the creek essentially becomes, you know, it, it, it quits becoming a bay and becomes a creek near where the causeway is from uh, the old George Washington grist mill or go down to the Mount Vernon yacht club basin, which is pretty much the hot spot in the entire Doe Creek Bay. Years ago, Doe Creek used to be probably one of the best water milfoil bays in the tidal Potomac Virginia side. The only place left on the Virginia side that has any decent milfoil I'm aware of is Quantico Creek. I, I can't explain why the Doe Creek milfoil bed disappeared about eight years ago, but it is gone and I don't think it's coming back. And there's almost no hydrilla in that creek either. So if you're looking for grass, um, I'd avoid Doe Creek as well. But the story changes when you go to our third creek, Pohick, uh, which is the next one downstream. And if you just notice, our y-axis is doubled. We're talking at now maximum 300 fish per hour catch rate. And as you can see, other than one spike we had, uh, we, we're, we're still in pretty good times right now. The, the error bars are confidence intervals based on standard error. So in other words, the last three years um, in Pohit Creek were not significantly different in terms of catch rate because the error bars overlap. And that's because fisheries data are notoriously highly variable. In other words, we might if we're out there, we go out there in April and May. And each day we're out there, we do three runs. So that gives us six runs. So each one of these error bars is based on six runs of data. If we go out there one day and we catch 150 bass an hour, we go out there the next day and we catch 50 bass an hour. That's that's a really big difference. And, and that's why what happens is if we get, you know, if we get a big spring storm the night before we go out, we don't change our plans. We still go out. And so our catch sucks that day, just like it might be for you if you're out hooking line fishing. Uh, we, we don't, you know, that's just part of the data and, and, and what we have to deal with. And so that's why sometimes these error bars are wider than others. So, but the bottom line is Pohick, <laughs> Pohick is, is full of SAV. It's a nice salad. It's not just hydrilla. There's a lot of Vallison area, water celery in there. There's a lot of coontail. Um, there's not a lot of milfoil, but, but there's, there's a good mix of native and uh, non-native vegetation in there. So I'm sure you're probably aware too, Pohick's got great kayak access. So if, if you are fishing kayak in, in Pohick, you probably should be. And then we get down to um, what um, somebody's already mentioned, uh, in a quiet creek, and we're still at, at, a, at a really high Y axis here. And the future is still looking really bright in a quiet creek at, at a, you know, 100 fish an hour bass catch rates. And again, the highly variable catch last year just sucked because of the spring storms. We didn't get great data, not tight confidence intervals like we had a few years before. But you can see we're trending in the right direction. Aquia, as has been noted, is a, is a bass hot spot. And um, the whole creek is just is loaded. Whether you're up around Aquia Harbor and the canals, or you go down you know, closer to Hope Springs and fish the islands, or any of the flat areas around there, it, it, is, it is just smoking hot right now. So, so Aquia and Pohick. And Quantico, as I mentioned, are pretty good. I wouldn't waste a whole lot of time in the Absco or Powell's. Aquaquans, I don't have Aquaquan in here, but if, if you ever have the opportunity to put a kayak in at Aquaquan Regional Park and paddle down, or, or better yet, save you some paddle time and put in at uh, Mason Neck and go up over on the other side of Canes Creek to Massey's Creek and fish the mouth of Massey's Creek. Canes Creek's not bad. But the mouth of Massey's Creek in April and May on an outgoing tide is truly spectacular. And I've never seen anything like it in a tidal system anywhere. Um, so put that in a footnote that mouth of Massey's Creek um, 
is phenomenal, which I don't have a slide for. But anyway, okay, go on to the next slide, Jim, please. I do have a question for you real quick, John. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, hang on. Let me take my notes real quick. Uh, we were talking about the uh, the catch rate per hour. Uh, and I know this only because of, uh, of our history, but would you mind explaining just real quick in a nutshell what you do when you go out as far as the intervals and how you're doing it? In other words, random versus fixed um, sampling, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a good question. So nor normally when we do electrofishing surveys, it's it's a it's a fairly fixed sampling regime. There, there's two schools of thought when you go out and collect data about whatever birds, fish, deer. You can do a random, completely random sample, or you do a fixed station sample. And there, there's there's positive and negatives to each school of thought. Generally, what we do when we go out and do these is we're, we're sampling the same reach of shoreline every time. Um, and, and, and I think for the purposes of temporal data, that is timelines, looking at changes over time, I think this is probably more meaningful unless you have the ability to do um, a fully random sample and, and, and do enough random samples so that your variability is accounted for. And that's a very difficult thing to do in a tidal system when we don't choose our tides. We, like I said, with the weather, with the storms, we set the date about a month in advance and we go. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter if it rained for three days before, we still go. Uh, and that's the same with tides. If we have a full moon spring tide uh, and we hit it at a low, we can't sample the site we did last time. We, you know, we're not even close to it. Um, so we try to do the best we can. Uh, so th that's a, that's an inherent bias that's built in to the business that we're in. Um, but we try to we try to get through that the best we can. Um, and, and that's versus, say, at Lake Anna with gill nets. That's a truly random sample. where we, we use a randomized block design to determine where we set our nets stratified by upper and lower lake. And, and, and we, you know, we draw those numbers and we set our nets in whatever block we get drawn. That's a random sample, truly. Whereas what we're doing in the tidal Potomac and Rappahannock is more of a fixed station analysis. So every time we go out there, we're doing we're doing a timed run. And each time to run is a third of an hour or 1,200 seconds. And so when we're on both pedals, that is the dipper's on his pedal or her pedal and the driver's on his pedal or her pedal, electricity is going into the water and that little second timer on the box is counting tick, 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 second, second, second. And when we get to 1,200, we're done. A third of an hour, 20 minutes, that run is over. We evaluate how many fish we've caught. We measure them and we release them. And that way we get that variability. I mentioned we have six sites at, at Aquia Creek uh, in 2022. Those six sites, each one of those sites is a result of uh, three runs per, per visit. So again, that's the, 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 in, in, in statistics, the higher, the more sample size, the better you, you can measure variability in your data. And so we're trying to trying to maximize that without just hamstringing ourselves by having to stop you know, every five minutes to, to, you know, get some crazy sample size number. Does that make right. sense? And so we have a follow on question coming from Mike Beck watching on YouTube. Are data products for these samplings available to the public? Our raw data is not really available to the public. They're in databases that we're currently, um, uh, what's, what's the technical term for it? We're converting, not converting. That's not too technical, but we're um, transitioning to a more friendly format. They were, they were in access data was very accessible um, uh, format. And so now what we're trying to do is put those in a format that might be more deliverable to constituents. But what I have are annual reports, but, uh, the type I was working on today that are highlighted bullets, which go over these sort of uh, metrics, catch rates and, and uh, proportional indices and things like that, that I would be happy to share with you. These are generally one to two or three page summaries each year of the different water bodies that, um, you know, uh, relay these results, but we don't have the raw data sheets available. If, if you're looking at the graph right now and you're showing that this is all on the tidal basin and you mentioned before how there it's, it's a pretty rugged, you know, piece of water for bass to thrive and to survive. I mean, these are really good catch numbers. And so when you look at these and you compare them to what's going on with the reservoirs, do you see a huge difference, not only in the catch rates, but the size of the bass, or is there anything that really does it? Is it something that you trace back down to the uh, to the bait fish that are in the area? What is it? 
Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. I've got an, I think my last slide might touch, might, might be a good springboard or segue for that because um, just remember now where we are. This is the best we saw. We were around 100 fish per hour total. Rappahannock here, we're combined, we're about close to 100 fish Sorry. per hour total. So just remember those numbers for catch rate. And I think the, no, not that one. Isn't there one more, Jim, uh, after um, I had some reservoir information in the, uh, the, the second PowerPoint. Oh, oh, you mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Go, go one more. I think there's another slide or two after a quiet. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Uh, all good. Hang on. Let, let me, let me, let me back out here. Cause I have a lag and I'm trying to move over around this lag. Hang on. Okay. Let me add you back to the previous thing here. Yeah, okay. So, this. okay. So, yeah. So this is the next one after a choir. So all, all this one demonstrates. So what I did with this one is I took everything in the Potomac, not just our four study creeks, but any data we had since we've been collecting data since Snakehead showed up for, it includes Powell's, Occoquan, Neabsco, Quantico, you know, and our four study creeks. And I just looked at fingerlings only. So we've got a different Y axis it's in between. Um, but I just wanted to, dem to, to show this to you all to demonstrate in a tidal system the recruitment variability. And I think, and again, this is one year lagged. So when you see the crash, what, what was the worst year we've ever had, at least in the last decade? It was 2019. Well, remember, we're out there in the spring, and so we're collecting fish from 2018. Well, some of you might remember what was 2018. Hmm. It was the wettest year in recorded human history. Okay. So except for Noah, no, that was the damn wet year. Uh, so it's nice, and it gives me confidence when we see a graph like this depict and represent what we expect to see happening. So we, we figured 2018 was a, was a washout in terms of bass spawning for everything spawning in a river. It sucked because it was a flood the entire year. Um, but you know, the gist of this is mother nature and the bass fishery can handle one shitty year, especially when you look at like the three ahead of it and the two behind it, actually three behind it, um, were all probably average or above average. So that's why the, the bass fishing on the Tidal River right now is pretty damn good is because for the last six years, we've had five good year classes, five excellent or to good year classes and only one bad year class. Um, so that that gets at the driver of this recruitment. Um, OK, next slide, please. Uh, OK, and I forgot I had this one in here. Th this is just snakeheads. Uh, it's all been bass till now. I threw in a snakehead catch rate just to kind of put things in perspective. Uh, snakeheads are a popular fish. People like to eat them. People like to catch them. There's a lot of controversy. They're doing this or doing that. I don't think they're doing anything other than trying to survive amidst the onslaught of bow fishing and hook and line and commercial activity. Look at the Y axis compared to all the bass slides we've just seen. The maximum, I mean, in 2013, 2014, when these fish hit the maximum, and these are in my core creeks, this is an average of little hunting, doge, and pohick, 10 fish an hour. Okay, what we've been sitting here talking about, what, 70 to 100 bass an hour? And here we throw in 10 snakeheads an hour into the mix is an interannual variability thing? It's a complete wash. The system can handle a niche, this niche, this predator at the same trophic level at this rate, at 10 fish an hour, it's it's completely meaningless when it comes to competition. There is no competition because the dietary resource is not limited. So it, it again, it, you know, when we saw that it shoot up, you know, in 05, 06, 07, it looked like it was going to keep going. Yeah, maybe there was some cause for concern at that point. But when we saw it peak and then decline after 2013, 2014, and not even get close to anywhere bass proportions, that's when, you know, you got to say, hey, guys, girls, this is not there's nothing to worry about here. And again, I am not here to propose to you the snakeheads are panacea or they're nothing to worry about or they're great fish. We don't want people moving fish, period, ever at all. But to the alarmist and the, the people that are still fear mongering, um, I, I think it's ridiculous. So that that's where I am with snakeheads right now. We okay. did see the numbers tick up slightly. This year, <laughs> the past couple of years. But again, if you look at the error bars, because of the data variability, this increase in the last four years is really not significant. And we're still significantly below what we were at the peak. So, so I'm not ready. And I'm sure, Greg, 
I'm sure Grace is going to say something, but because you brought it up, and I have to, uh, because we, uh, so many of us on the team love to fish for snakehead and, and also eat good snakehead. So I will say this, though, or I will ask this question. Uh, what is the current law state right now if someone, if an angler is out there and they catch a snakehead, do they have to kill it? Can they release it? Can they keep it? What, is the rule, what do the rules say, please? So that way we can clarify. The, the current law is the same as it always has been in Virginia, and I think always has been in the other states. You cannot possess a live snakehead. You don't have to kill it. We can't force you to kill anything. Um, there's no judge, jury in the country or the world. I don't, well, maybe I don't say the world, but um, <laughs> maybe the, the government can't force you to kill something. Okay. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, the way it's always been in Virginia is you can't be in possession of a live snakehead. Virginia law does not consider possession the mere act of catching and unhooking. So it's completely legal and ethical if you deem so to catch a snakehead unhook it and release it at the point of capture the moment you take it into possession that is put it in a live well put it in a cooler put it on a stringer it has to be dead okay that that's the distinction so most people aren't doing that and and nobody's gotten a ticket that i'm aware of it's not being enforced but still that's the law why did i and I'm sorry, one more question. So if I take, uh, you know, say I, say I take my, my little brother Matt out and we go catch snakehead and he wants to keep it, does he have to report it? By law, you're still required to report the catch. 99.9% .9 of people catching and harvesting snakeheads do not report their catch. Right. Nobody's ever been arrested for not reporting their catch. Um, there's still the archaic 8, eight whatever it is, 866 number, Um there's still the there's different ways to report it but no it's, it's a we'll joke it for you. No, nobody's reporting that. <laughs> but it's still something that's good though for conservation right <clears throat> it's, it's good the, the, what it helps me to do is to pick up uh potentially new uh, a, a change in um distribution new, new colonized waters because okay. we do get some leads that way but in terms of me documenting yeah i caught five fish in mcquire creek yesterday honestly i don't care but Technically, by law, you're still required to report it. Typically, I have a ton of people from Quantico and Chapawamza Creek are have an inordinately high reporting ratio. I think because they're military and they feel like they need to do the right thing to stay in line. So I get like everybody, they call me up and they call me, sir, and they say, I'm reporting a snakehead I harvested. And they're really polite and they're really nice phone calls, but they're like the only ones reporting snakeheads. <laughs> And God bless him for it too. All right. Hey, Jim and John, I've got uh, Josh Sumler here. He uh, he's an avid snakehead and bow fisherman. He's got a couple questions. No, for <laughs> not ahead, bow fishing. But I know you guys finally just added some regulations to that. I mean, with the data you're just showing there, that these snakeheads just fit right in and aren't causing anything. It's like, is there any hope for more strict regulations on this bow fishing? Because I mean, if I know if I got a spot with snakeheads and it gets out, that place is wiped out within a summer. Oh, I hear you. And 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 well, our agencies heard you. We we do a a biennial regulation change, right? That means every two years, I think, if I got that right, every two years we solicit our constituents for comments and concerns and what we should be doing with our regulations. And that we did we just coming through the cycle this past year. And we had more public comments about northern snakeheads than any species in the state, more than trout, more than bass, more than muskie. Uh, and 100 percent of those comments were conservation oriented, reduce bow fishing, put in bag limits, put in size limits. And so far, our administration has been completely deaf to those concerns. So it's going to take a few more years of, of uh, public comment like that to hopefully start to swing that arc where people will begin to listen um, to our constituents. But right now they're not. And that's a fact. I mean, I guess it's not fully deaf because you guys did drop new regulations on bow fishing. So like, is well, yeah, there, but they I know, had nothing to do with snakehead, right? That was, that was bow fin and, and other stuff. Yeah. But I mean, if you can get them off the water as much as possible, because I know they, you know, they, drive through all the marsh grass they do all kinds of damage in other ways not just me selfishly not wanting them to kill the snakeheads <laughs> well but. we we had it, it in the, like most things in life there's a few bad apples you know ruin it for everybody and, 
And there's a couple jerks out there that are they're putting a lot of arrows and a lot of fish, whether it's gar or carp or whatever, and just leaving them to rot either the boat ramp or floating around. And so that's gotten them a bit of a black eye. And we've, we've tried to be proactive with the Bow Fishing Association and, and trying to get them to clean their act up. But the bottom line was th there's there's a lot of ambivalence within the, the biological community, whether it's here in Virginia or, or outside our state, when it comes to native fish like northern, uh, excuse me, like like uh, long nose gar and like bowfin. And we just don't see as necessary the indiscriminate killing of a lot of these fish just to be wasted wantonly wasted uh and that's why you saw some of those changes in, in in those uh bag limits it had nothing to do with snakeheads yeah I, i'm and i'm trust me i'm happy to see a start on that i mean i can't tell you how many times i've been out and just seeing gar and both in with holes in them floating around so it's nice to see a start i just i hate the, i hate the thing altogether it just doesn't seem like more than spotlighting a deer to me so right Good to John, see. Where where's the hot spots right now for for larger mature snakeheads? Is it is it Potomac or is it now becoming the wrap? Well, Don't okay. So I, I just finished crunching those numbers today, and for whatever reason, the, the wrap the wrap was colonized about ten years later, and we're still not seeing a lot of large snakeheads in the wrap. We're seeing we're seeing a lot decent numbers in the wrap. We, we saw more snakeheads in the wrap this past year than we've ever seen. I thought it might have hit a peak, but it hadn't yet. Um, but most of the fish are young and small fish. The mortality rate is about 15 points higher in the Rappahannock than it is in the Potomac. Wow. There's a lot, there's a lot of pressure right now in the Rappahannock that's being directed just in the last year or two. A lot of the tidal creeks downstream of Port Royal, uh, like Baylor's and, um, they're not my creeks. So I, they don't, they don't come anywhere at the top of my head, but P, uh, PD, I think, uh, Baylor's, um, there's, but but basically any creek with grass downstream of Port Royal is going to be loaded with snakeheads. But the bow fishermen have figured that out. The, the thing that you guys have to use to your advantage is you can get usually get shallower than the bow fishermen can. And you just got to use that to your advantage to get back in in the really, really skinny water. Um, and that's the same on the, you know, uh, Bruce, the, the guy that wrote the book on snakehead fishing. I think he primarily fishes the uh, Nanjamoy. You know, he, he gets he stays way back. He, he never sees a, you know, a bass boat or a, a, a bow boat because of how skinny water he's in. And, and that's, you know, that's where the, that's where the, the big snakes are. You know, a lot, we, we still see a lot of really big snakes from time to time in Pohick uh, and time to time in Aquaya. There, there's, if you're actually looking for the, the dragons, you're probably better off still sticking to those Potomac trips right now than the Rappahannock. Uh, just because we see the prevalence of, of very, you know, over 800 millimeter fish, we're talking 35 inch, you know, range fish in, in those, uh, in those Potomac creeks rather than the Rappahannock. They're just not in the Rappahannock right now, either because uh, they, they just have, it hasn't been long enough colonization or the bow fishing pressure is too high. One or the other, or both. Two part question for you, John, what's the largest snakehead that you've ever electrofished? Uh, and can you really quickly cover the 10 year cycle that you've informed me of in the past? That what was the last part, the 10 year cycle, uh, the 10 year trend, not the cycle, but the trend. So you see about, about the 10 year mark, eight to 10 years where you'll see that the numbers of the population of snakehead will basically start. To oh, right. Peak out right. And then start well, that, decline. yeah, well, so, that's what I thought I had into the Rappahannock until this past year. So it, it, what, it, it, what he's alluding to the biggest fish we've ever seen shocking for snakes um, is probably pushing 16 pounds, maybe 15 and a half. And that fish was 36 inches close to be thereabouts. Um, and, and we've seen a few slightly less than that. It's sort of like largemouth. I mean, there's, there's not that many mm. big fish out there. People think we see a lot of big fish. We don't because proportionally there's not that many of them. Um, so, you know, we probably see a few more than you all do, but not that many more. It's not like there's a ton of huge fish just laying around out there. Um, but what I thought, what, what happened in the Potomac was, was all our creeks peaked in terms of maximum abundance of snakeheads about 10 years post discovery, which is probably about 14 years post colonization, because it took about four years for them to show up on the radar. Uh, and it looked like I was really psyched on the Rappahannock last year because it was colonized 10 years later. And we actually hit a peak in 2020 and declined last year uh, in, in 2021 or two years ago. And I thought, holy crap, 
this would be amazing if in, you know, adjacent drainages colonized a decade apart, if they both reached the apex at the, the same amount post post discovery or post colonization. But it didn't, it, like I said, there's, there's, no, there's never usually any certainties in science and nature. And, and it, it, you know, threw a monkey wrench in that plan because the, this past year we had actually the highest catch rate of snakes in the rapid hand we've ever had at uh, 10 fish an hour, which was up from about six fish an hour the previous year. Uh, but again, most of those fish were small. Most of them were two-year-olds and they were, you know, 17 inch, 16, 17 inch fish. So, and what about um, the bass population as far as size, if you were to compare apples to apples? The, apples the bass to apples population uh, in the tidal Rappahannock and the tidal Potomac are very, very similar. And I think that's because they're functioning pretty much in the same manner. In other words, what's a good year class in the Potomac is going to be a good year class in the Rappahannock. So we've had all these good years in both rivers. The difference is productivity. Fish in the, in the, in the, in the Potomac system always grow faster. And they're typically in better condition than fish in the Rappahannock. That's true for catfish. It's true for bass. It's true for snakeheads. It's just a more productive system. It's a bigger fish factory. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't mean that, that the, the, the largemouth in the Rappahannock are, are less spectacular. They're, they're still football shaped. Tidal river fish, whether you're in the Chick, the James, the Rap, the Potomac, river fish tend to be a little bit more robust, a little rounder, a little fatter, a little faster growing than reservoir fish. And, and it, which is kind of counterintuitive because I just told you that a, res, a river is a more harsh place to live. But the trade off to that is that the recruitment is more highly variable. So when it's good, it's good. But when it's bad, it's bad. And it can be really bad. Um, so you get those bad year classes built in, which is OK, as I mentioned, if it's one or two here or there. But when you get a string of bad year classes, that's when you want to confine your fishing for several years to a much more stable environment like a reservoir. Um, which reservoirs are always stable, which means they're typically always good fishing. And we have a couple really, really amazing reservoirs uh, in our proximity to Northern Virginia. Two of them I manage and know very well. One's Lake Anna uh, and the other's Occoquan Reservoir. And I think I've got a slide, maybe my last slide in this show, Jim. Might yeah, let me pull, yeah, let me pull up that. real quick. And I read the the latest release by DWR talking about the uh, the top ten fisheries in Virginia, and uh, I saw one of our our bodies of water was in that top five. I won't mention it, but uh, it was really good information. I'm sure you you were, you already know. So yeah, so there should be Jim. There should be one videos. more one more slide, one more at the end of that the other the other talk. <laughs> it keeps there escaping you. you. It does. It after I'm sorry. This one. I thought it was only six slides. Should probably. be the next one. I, I just. Yep, I just hit the I hit the button on you. There we go. Okay, so this is a completely different look, and it's kind of boring, and I apologize for that. Uh, but this is the top eight bass lakes in Northern Virginia for our electrofishing catch rate. And what I want you to look at the the, the, the left the, the far right hand column, and that far right hand column that starts with eleven, uh, which is the number of twenty inch bass per hour and over. OK, so in, in the year we surveyed most recently, we survey Anna every year because it's really, really important from an economic standpoint. Um, Occoquan gets surveyed about every three to four years. Some of these lakes don't get surveyed, but every six years. Occoquan Reservoir in 2020 was the best survey I've ever had in my life. I... We spent two days on that lake. One day we put out a fountainhead. The other day we put out a lake ridge. And the water was actually slightly turbid. The sampling conditions weren't the best. And I can't figure out if that helped us. It should have hurt us. In other words, we should have had more fish than we got. Um, but 94 15-inch and over fish an hour and 11 M's an hour is truly astonishing. And I will tell you all that this is not only the this is not only the best in my district. This is the best in Virginia, and I think it might be one of the better rates nationally for a lake considered a large reservoir. And large reservoirs are typically those considered over 500 acres. And Occoquan's over 2,000 acres. So for a lake the size of Occoquan to be putting out 11 m's an hour is extraordinary. The knock on Occoquan. I've been working this district now for over 30 years, and my old boss. The, 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 the manager of Pohick, not Pohick, um, uh, Fountainhead, 
Fountainhead Regional Park would come into Ed's office and he would bitch and moan. This is 20, 25 years ago that all he could catch was three to four pound largemouth in Occoquan Reservoir. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, if you got a bitch about something, buddy, is that really what you're going to pick that? You know, yeah, that's not something like, to bitch about. What's, what's wrong with catching three to fours all day long? And he'd be like, well, I can never catch an eight. I can't even catch a seven. Well, the strange thing is an Occoquan, like Anna, uh, and Anna, I think I can explain it a little better, but at Occoquan, I'm not sure how to explain it because it's a different type of reservoir, but we've seen the numbers over the years consistently ticking up, both in catch rates of P's, which is 15 inch and over, and M's, which is 20 inch and over per hour. Now, Occoquan, as you probably know, has both gizzard shad and alewives, which is a, a pretty dramatic forage base in addition to the white perch and bluegill and everything else in there. And it's got plenty of woody habitat. Uh, and it's um, it, to, to see it where it is now it, it is truly amazing. And these fish are so unbelievably fat. The condition factors are off the chart. And, and they are actually so, fatter than river fish. Condition factors relative John, weights, however you want to quantify it. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So yeah. I want to ask, you said you went out in 2020. And right. And... I think it was 2019 that I caught a smallmouth bass just above Lake Ridge uh, or just west of Lake Ridge. And I'm wondering if in your sampling, you saw an uprise in that on the Occoquan Reservoir. I, I've never seen a smallmouth on the Occoquan. Back when we used to sample Lake Manassas, we would get a fair number of smallmouth on the upper end of Manassas. Uh, Beaver Dam Creek Reservoir before it got drained and was dry for a number of years. We used to see a fair amount of smallmouth in Beaver Dam Creek Reservoir in Loudoun County. I've never seen a smallmouth in Occoquan, but no. we don't sample the extreme upper areas. The, 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 high, the furthest upstream we go from Fountainhead is up around Ryan's Dam. Uh, so we don't yeah, get that, that really was far be my next up. question, yeah. Because the far up, I, I mean, do you guys sample Lake Jackson at all? No, that's not public water. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, some people say that that's where the smallmouth come from, is they come from Lake Jackson, and they come down, and, and from Lake Manassas, from the upper, you know, stream of, uh, above Bull Run, uh, and Bull Run Marina, you know, up there, people catch smallmouth quite often, I feel like. Um, I've seen at least three or four uh, in the past couple months, so I don't know if that's something that the state would look into more to see if that, I mean, see if that is rebounding somewhat. Yeah, smallmouth bass in Northern Virginia are not a reservoir fish. The way our lakes stratify in the summer is not conducive for small. Smallmouth bass are a cool water fish and they don't do well in eutrophic reservoirs like Occoquan, like Jackson, like Manassas. The, the times that we see smallmouth in lakes like those are typically when they get washed down in a flood and they end up in those embayments and they either can't figure their way out of it or they decide that maybe right now things aren't so bad. The lake hasn't stratified yet, so they haven't been subjected to that warm water or they haven't tried to go down to that cooler water where there's no oxygen. Um, so if the habitat was there in those reservoirs, we'd see many, many more smallmouth bass, but we don't. Uh, which is why, you know, it, it's it's th those reservoirs are not hospitable for smallmouth, which is typically when we did see the smallmouth in those lakes, we would find them at the extreme upper ends where the feeder creeks or rivers enter into those those systems. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of an anomaly. They show up here and there, not to say that, you know, you can't catch a big smallmouth anywhere at, at some point or another. Again, there's no absolutes in science and nature. Uh, but generally speaking, smallmouth will not do well in Northern Virginia lakes. John, what's been the main forage of both bass and um, uh, largemouth bass and um, snakeheads? What, what's been like if you were to pick one um, item to emulate, would it be a shad? Would it be a crawfish? What would be the top uh, forage? Um, it, I think it differs depending on species. So northern snakeheads are the ultimate opportunists. I honestly don't believe what you throw. If they're hungry, they will eat. Uh, and because they almost always live in aquatic vegetation, it has to be weedless. So whether it's a weedless frog, a senko, um, a chatterbait before the weeds come up and you're dragging it over what little grass there is, it, I, I don't think it matters. If the snakehead's hungry, it will eat. Um, it, it's dietary. 
contents are typically either banded killifish or bluegill. Those are the two most popular food items for snakeheads. For bass, it's very similar, although you're going to find more gizzard shad uh, and bluegill and, and perhaps white perch and largemouth than you are in snakeheads. And then later in summer, when the hydrilla mats get really thick, they're going to switch over a lot to crayfish when those crayfish get abundant in those mats. So uh, basically, they're both opportunists. So I don't know that, you know, I think it's more important to try to mimic whatever the prevailing forage item might be, whether you're on a, a shallow vegetated flat and you're trying to, you know, pretend you're a banded killifish or, you know, maybe a gizzard shad is a, a, chat, a white chatterbait or, or something like that. You know, it, it just or later in the season, you know, uh, you know, a crayfish imitation, maybe, you know, a pumpkin seed senko or something like that. I, I just um, yeah, it. it I, I honestly don't think it matters that much because those fish are ultimate opportunists. Okay. Uh, so phenomenal, phenomenal information, by the way, on everything that we're talking about, especially when it came up to the snakehead. And then of course the catch rates per hour. Uh, did you have another slide in the slide deck? No, that's yeah. it. You finally got to the end. On that one. Okay. Hey, real quick. Uh, uh, that's not true. You had one more. You got slide eight on that one. Ah, uh, this is damn mission. it! You're right. Yeah, was see, wrong. who's wrong now? Huh? Yeah, you you got it. You got it, big man. <laughs> All right, my last slide is Lake Anna. So if you haven't been down there, go because fish is damn good. Um, <laughs> this, the, the linear regression on the left slide is catch per effort total, like you've already seen this, but it's 150 on the y-axis, which is really, really damn good. And you'll yeah. see the last few years have been really, really damn good. And this is not even really well the f1 stockings are kind of displayed here but not totally because we're still just beginning and the right hand side is the catch rate of memorables that's a 20 inch and over fish uh you, there's a lot more scatter there but the trend is positive and that's going to get much more defined as the f1 fish come into play so this is just my my plug for lake anna aquaquan and anna uh, e either lake you can't go wrong if you want to get off the river and, and again in the spring Rivers are hard to fish. You know, if we get two or three days of rain, I'll go to Lake Anna or go to the Occoquan, go to the lower end, go to Lake Ridge, go down to, um, you know, the state park at Lake Anna or 208, because these lakes are giant settling basins and they can get you away from the harsh, turbid waters of spring and put you into some productive clear water or, you know, moderately clear water where you can have some good fish. Uh, real quick uh, comment from actually coming from my brother, Matt, he said to say hello and uh, he appreciates uh, the, the comments about Fountainhead as well, because he did. He caught his five pound out there between Bull Run and Fountainhead. It was the middle of winter. And uh, as we're going through these metrics and we take a look at this on Lake Anna and the reservoir, you're talking about 150 per hour. Yeah. And what's the what are the, uh, the difference between the M and the P? Was that 15 inches up to 20 inches? Is that going to is that yeah, they be? A, P, a P is 15 inch and over inclusive and an M's 20 inch and over. So M's a but, much smaller subset of P. And the rest still takes the cake when it comes to beating out Lake Anna as far as. Oh, yeah. In, yeah, in yeah, 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 yeah. By far the best. Yeah. In wow. Now, wow. It, probably, it probably won't in three or four years once those F1s all come, you know, to size. But right now it does. So what is it? This is what the third year for F1s? Yeah. Okay. And that's in Lake Anna right now. What about any other fisheries that we know of that they've been stocked in? Um, Smith Mountain and um, Clater, I think. So, okay, so let me back up then. The, the, the report that was released by DWR stated that, that if you take one of our local reservoirs in Spotsylvania County, that was number three. Smith Mount Lake was uh, number two. And then um, what's the other one? What's Hey, Greg, what's the one that uh, Jonathan Graham fishes out of out there? Is it Smith Mount Lake or? That, uh, that's, yeah, Smith Mountain and... Um, um... You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, it's in Farmville. Oh, my gosh. No, Briar what? Creek. No, the Briar, one next no, to No, 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 not the other one. The other one. Sandy? Uh, one next Sandy. One. Sandy. Yeah, Sandy yeah. Creek, right. Yeah, yeah. So that was actually number one in the state. Then you had uh, Smith Mountain Lake, which was number two. Uh, and we're talking about citation fish that were being caught on them now. Citations. So not it's a complete it's it's a different scale. We're not talking about 20 inches and above. We're talking about citation fish at 22 inches or six pounds that were being right. caught on these. And they had by by the the numbers that were being reported. That's reported. That's not that that's coming from the different population. It's coming from a different side of the house as opposed to what you're actually doing, which yep. you know is it's going to skew with the view that we have right now. So that is going to be yeah. a skew. 
Jim, have a quick question. I mean, uh, John, have a quick question. Um, are you seeing a bunch of snakeheads eating bass like everybody is freaking out about? Is that a myth? <laughs> <laughs> no, we've seen almost no snakeheads eating bass. In fact, I think we probably have snakeheads eating snakeheads about as prevalent as we have snakeheads eating bass. And we also have numerous accounts of bass eating snakeheads. So it, it's, there's zero to that argument. It's not happening. This is on film, y'all. We will make sure it gets out. Yeah, there. right. So I guess what we're saying, what we're asking for the record is our snakehead, the monsters that folklore and all the urban legends that surround them are out to really be. Do they really measure up to that? Uh, and I know as a biologist, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot like that, brother, but I, I have to because I did during the first time we ever interviewed, you remember, I said that the, the first question out of my mouth was snakehead or bass. You, you, I couldn't hold your feet to the fire on that one. But the second question is, is it really true? Are they built up to be the monsters that they are? And we, we know they're not. No, I mean, the concern still is if snakeheads get into a place where they're, say, an endangered sunfish, like a black banded sunfish, they, they could hurt that population. But in terms of competition with bass, there's no argument. I mean, that's settled science. We It's in the symposium. It's published years ago. Um, Lake Biwa in Japan, both species introduced. Uh, bass kick the shit out of snakeheads. There, there's no, there's just, there's, <laughs> there's no contest. Um, almost every place where, where they've coexisted, bass have won. Uh, every place I know of, they've won. So, it, 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 yeah, it, there's, there's no it's, argument that snakeheads hurt bass. It, it, it's a specious argument. It's not based on science. It's based on fear and somebody has an ulterior motive. So it really comes down to the teeth and the way people are trying to personify them. That's infinitesimal as opposed to really what the true credibility is by, by fact, of the, by, by default of what your metrics are that you just showed us. It really Correct. doesn't measure up. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to this slide, you, uh, I don't see the number one. So that means this slide deck is out. We'll move to the last slide. I believe this is the one that's going to talk about Alabama bass, correct? Yeah. So I just want to run through nice. here and just, just point out a couple things real quick. I, there's a lot of stuff in here I'm not going to cover. This is a this was a talk that was given by Steve Sammons at a professional meeting last year. And there's a lot of people, including Virginia, two years ago, we weren't we had no idea about the dangers of Alabama bass. Um, and we sort of found out about it by accident. And, uh, and, and now it's everybody in the East coast of the U S is taking note. And, and we have an entire day symposium devoted to this topic in two weeks in Norfolk, people from all over the Southeast will be talking about the damage this fish is doing to smallmouth and largemouth. So you can change, go ahead now. And so as, the, as you would surmise based on the species name, Alabama bass are endemic mostly to Alabama. Okay, go on. Uh, and we can see here the progression of introduction, sort of like snakeheads. They're really good at colonization, increasing their range. Unlike snakeheads, they're not really good migrants. So that this increase in range is almost all done at the hands of well-intended fishermen. Um, but they're not helping us at all um, by moving these fish around, which is why it's illegal to move any freaking fish at all. So we've seen this fish now in 2020s in Virginia. Okay, next slide. And so there's two ways that these fish are really screwing with us. Um, one is with direct competition with largemouth, and this has been peer reviewed and published. And another is with hybridization with smallmouth. So if you like, if you like either catching big largemouth or you like catching smallmouth, period, um, then you need to be concerned right now, because chances are we we might be uh, we, we we might have already seen the best. Well, okay, I still think we have a couple of years of largemouth, the best ever in Virginia. I think we may have seen the best smallmouth ever in Virginia already, and we could be sunsetting. Um, I think we've got a few more years of the best largemouth, and maybe we can stop the, the spread of, of Alabama's into, say, places like Lake Anna. But, okay, next slide. So I think first we're going we're gonna to concentrate on the um, – the bottom line was with appearance on these things, even biologists a lot of times can't tell what it is. And that's because we're dealing with uh, genetic introgression. And so 
we could be looking at a two-way, three-way, four-way, five-way. It sounds kinky. Um, just, there's a lot of wacky crap <laughs> going on with these fish, and they are uh, – yes, thank you for putting that number up. That is the correct hotline that I'm, I still check once in a while. Um, but, yeah, so it's really – unless you get a fin clip, which is how – we have to get a fin clip from suspect fish and send them off to a lab for about $20 a pop, and then we find out what the actual genetic makeup is. But, okay, next slide. Um, these, these graphs generally depict, yeah, you know what, uh, Jim, it's, I think there's a, there's a cleaner slide. Steve, excuse me, Steve had a lot of different examples of, of, uh, Alabama bass, largemouth in, uh, thing going on. Go ahead to the next slide. And we'll see if we can get a cleaner one. This, this one's a little cleaner. So Lake Norman is just South of us in North Carolina. And the top, the top uh, chart shows, the decline in catch rate. This is a very similar graph. Of course, our catch, their y-axis isn't as nice as our y-axis, but they're using a different metric. They're not using fish per hour. They're using number of fish per 300 meters of shoreline, which is a wacky metric, I think, but I'm not collecting their data. So I don't. I guess I don't really care. Uh, but you can see what happened. And this is a standardized collection for them. The largemouth catch went from pretty good, apparently, to almost nothing, whereas the Alabama bass went from nothing to a ton of Alabama bass. Um, and so... What this is showing you is that there is a replacement here, that Alabama bass became a dominant species uh, and there was no change in the overall black bass abundance. In other words, this wasn't an additive thing that may or may not have been OK. But if you like to fish for largemouth, this really sucks because the Alabama bass generally don't get very large. So you're going to end up catching a whole bunch of small, like one, one and a half pound Alabamas instead of, you know, three, four, five, six pound largemouth. OK, next slide, please. Um, so I think this is sort of the same thing here. Okay, next slide. Uh, I don't need to, that's, this is too much in the weeds, I think, at this point. Um, so, and this is, okay, so th there's no question that Alabama's replaced largemouth and especially in a eutrophic reservoir. Now we're into more smallmouth bass and spotted bass waters. And we have this thing called hybridization or what we call introgression, where they interbreed. So go ahead, next slide, please. And I think what these bar charts are trying to depict, and we have Lake Gaston, uh, North Carolina, which borders Virginia. And this was in the, th th this shows you the problem with, with biologists identifying 100% of these fish as spotted bass in Lake Gaston. Yet when we did the genetic analysis on them, or when North Carolina did the genetic analysis on them, they found out that what, 25% of them were Alabamas, uh, part of them were Alabamas and largemouth, part of them were Alabamas and spots. So you've got this hodgepodge, this mix of, of interaggression occurring in what was traditionally a spotted bass population in with in context with the largemouth fishery as well. OK, next slide, please. So here we are in our home state of, of Virginia, and we're looking at what the biologists thought in the field was what it was versus what the genetics showed it to be. And the big disconnect here, as you can see, are the, the red bars with nothing, which is the spots. Uh, and they thought maybe Alabama hybrids. And then it turns out you had the Alabama smallmouth uh, hybrids was, was the, uh, the big one where nobody suspected. So all of a sudden now, Philpot is a two-story lake. Um, the gentleman asked earlier about smallmouth bass and some of the Northern Virginia re uh, reservoirs where they don't do well at all. Philpot, Philpot um, we have trout in, in addition to smallmouth in that reservoir, because this is what we call a two-stage fishery, which is very, very rare in Virginia, meaning that in the summer below the thermocline, you have cold water that's got oxygen in it, um, which is very important if you try to have uh, a fish, a cold or cold water fish like trout or uh, smallmouth in that situation. And so in this situation, you do have a, a lake that's conducive to a two-stage fishery, but alas, the smallmouth are now becoming hybrids of Alabamas. Okay, next slide, please. Um, same thing here, just more data. Next slide. So basically what, and this is the quick tank home here is, is you've got largemouth bass impacted through direct competition with no genetic impacts, but you have, uh, Alabama bass. Uh, okay. Next slide. That's just with largemouth, smallmouth genetic testing. And we, we have Alabama bass now in a bunch of Virginia systems, including Clater Lake, the new river, the new river. One of the best smallmouth, probably the best smallmouth fishery in the state 
is now crawling with Alabama's and Alabama spot, you know, smallmouth three ways. Um, it's, it's, it's really bad. And, and so, you know, you heard a lot of people tell you snakeheads were bad. I think this is bad. Uh, so, you know, put the word out. If you have anybody that's thinking of trying to move Alabama's or fi- especially any black bass, any fish, don't move fish. Um, for Christ's sake, just leave them alone. Um, anyway, that, that, that's just what the point I wanted to get out and try to impress on you all is, is, is honestly, and, and our fish chief, Mike Bignarski, I think feels the same way. He's a lot more concerned about Alabama bass right now than snakeheads, although he wouldn't admit it, but I'll, I'll, I'll put that out there for him. Um, this, this is, could be a really, really big deal and a bad thing for fisheries in Virginia. So John, great presentation and appreciate the information. Is there anything that we can do to be able to contribute back information flow? Just, just be proactive out there in your conversations and your interactions with, with, with your peers. And, um, you know, just, just, Try to keep it real. That's what I, that's all, you know, my whole life. That's what I've tried to do is give the best information I have. And if, if it's a threat, you know, say it's a threat. If I don't think it's a threat, I'll say, I don't think it's a threat. Um, but, you know, tell, tell people out there, you think these Alabamas are bad and they could screw up a lot of your favorite fishing holes. And is there anything we can do as a mitigation towards this, aside from just awareness and spreading the word? I mean, it, it sounds like there's that, really honestly, that Jim, that's the biggest thing. I mean, people follow actions and follow leads, you know, and, and you're all out there as sort of leaders in your field and, 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 you know, semi-professional anglers, you know, you, you can, you can form a lot of opinion and, and, and you, you've got followers, whether you know it or not, you know, people are looking at you all. And so just lead by example. Roger that, Roger. That. And, and as I understand it from what you were just saying, there's really no way to be able to, to determine an Alabama bass from, you know, uh, a spotted bass or large it's bass. It's, it's just by sheer near numbers. We can't do smaller. it. You know, we can't do it. So, I mean, you know, once in a while you get a guess right, but but uh, it's really hard to do. And we've talked about the before the uh, size of the mouth, and I don't want to take too much more time because we've been on here for an hour and 20 minutes already. But uh, like some of those bass that I've noticed when we're out there catching them, they're, you, you just – hold them up and you can tell they don't, they're not a large mouth, uh, even just because of the length by virtue of the opening of their mouth. Do you think that this is what the impact is when it comes from Alabama bass? Is there interbreeding and you have a hybridization with large mouth or is just an anomaly? Well, it, so far it hasn't been demonstrated that hybridization with large mouth is a, is as big a thing and it's, it's happening. And not to say again, you know, with nature and science, it, it absolutely could be happening. So if you have a fish that to you, looks 100% abnormal. Like you're like, I've handled a hundred fish in the last three weeks. And this fish is just way out of the box. Take a fin clip, put in a little envelope or put it, you know, wrap it up in a piece of paper, write down the date, the location and get that to me. And and, uh, we'll get it submitted. So John, it's funny you say that. I want to show you something here real quick. This has been highly debated. This was a couple, this was about two years ago. I caught this in Richardsonville and people said that this, they swear this is a large mouth. I don't think so. I mean, it could be. It had a very smaller mouth, but if you look at this, like the the um, basically the, the the connected lines all the way down and how dark it was, I I don't know, man. I mean, that looked like a hybrid bass to me, or a spotted bass, or even an Alabama bass. But it was it was a very small mouth. I had the mouth open pretty large, but that bass right there, man, did not look like a large mouth to me. Yeah, I honestly, I, I can't tell you. I mean, looking yeah. at a picture like that, it's, it's impossible. Yeah. I, I, you know, people say, oh, that's just a large mouth. I don't think so. I think like you're talking about, I think that might have been an Alabama bass, man. And, and where was it? Yeah. Richardsonville. It was on, um, it was on, um, we launched out of uh, Route 3. Uh, what's that? What's that? Um, the Rapid Ann River. Okay. Well, yeah. I can't. It, it, it could have been a natural hybrid between a large mouth and a small mouth, I guess, which is very, very unusual, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Greg, when you're talking about the size of the opening of the mouth, it's the same thing. Cause when I was talking to John, the last time I was out on the water, I sent him photographs when I was actually on the kayak and I was like, this is not right. It, it just didn't seem right. Normally when you hold up a large mouth, you have that nice big open gaping mouth there. In this case, it looked like it was just, it looked like a small, just a smaller mouth, even to where the, the, the top lip would close down and it would have an underbite almost to the point to where it was questionable. Like, is this just a fish that it was deformed? Was it a fish that had some type of uh, hybridization going on? And this is why I started to send him some of the pictures I did. And this is really where the topic came from, for me anyway, not him, but for me to start asking questions. 
So yeah. is that what we're talking about, uh, Greg? Sorry, John. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it was a miniature mouth. It, like you said, it, it just I know what large mouth look like, but but that, that didn't look like a large mouth at all. It, you know, just the way yeah. yeah, the just the line and markings, but anyway, that's good to know because I'll be, I'll be honest with you in the kayak community. Um, in the kayak fishing community, to be honest with you, Alabama bass are praised and like Pickwick Lake. Um, you know, there, if you go up, actually, we just had a controversy with, with a guy, um, his name is Drew Gregory, who went up 25 miles up a Creek, fished this area. Uh, and all he caught was Alabama bass and it was like 20, 21 inches. And people are like, Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, blah, blah, blah. And they, people like the community will go out there and purposely try to catch them you know, because they're super aggressive, you know? Right. Yep. So, yeah, it's I mean, a, that's. It's a flash in the pan, though. It won't last. And you end up with a bunch of little potato chips, like crappy and Lake Brittle. They're going to be six inches. Yeah. Mm. Very, very small ones. So. All right. Yep. So, hey, uh, did anybody from the team have anything they wanted to uh, bring up real quick? So we uh, we don't want to go too long and keep. Lauren asked, should, uh, should Alabama you know, bass be harvested? Yes. Yes. If, if you think it's an Alabama <laughs> threat. Kill it. Okay. Kill it. Kill it. Right on. We'll, we'll and honestly, Lauren, hey, good, good one. Our, our, uh, our harvest rates on black bass are so low that we just did a krill survey on the tidal Potomac this year. 99.9% .9 were released. <laughs> I mean, that's what? an extent. So, so no one keeps bass. No one keeps bass. So the, the bottom line is if you kill a few bass, don't feel bad about it. Uh, if you think it's in Alabama, make it a fish fry. You, you're doing You're doing everything a good. <laughs> <laughs> certainly definitely will definitely will anybody else uh out there if we have anyone who are uh, posing any questions or if you have questions now's the time going once going twice nobody in the in the uh within the team okay so this was a great team building event john thank you so much for taking the time out of your personal time and your personal life to come and talk to us and educate us uh this is honestly probably one of the most informational forms i've, I've had in a long time you talk to my brother about this too you, you need to have your own podcast because when you start talking, people gravitate towards you and they start to listen and they shut up because you have a good way about explaining things. You're very technical and very scientific, uh, but it's very, very easy for the layman to be able to understand what you're saying and how you're uh, how you're describing everything that we need to be able to bring it down to our level. Uh, that means that we're going to be able to talk to our colleagues and be able to push this kind of information out so they know Alabama bass, hey, knock that crap off. This is not, no, it's not what we want. We want largemouth. We want F1 strains. Snakehead, hey, when the when the what is it the biannual uh, uh, regulation vote comes cycle. up? Regulation That's right. When that regulation cycle. cycle comes up, we're going to make sure that we start to go ahead and say vote yes for uh, snakehead regulation, so that way we can add them to the uh, protected species list and we can start to get them regulated without any kind of boat fishing. Anyway, I had to throw that in there. Hey, John, thank you. It's been a pleasure, my friend. As Thanks. always, I, I can't thank you enough. And right. I know my the pleasure, Washington yeah. Warhawks, thank you. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and end the broadcast out there in KFL land, Washington Warhawk land. You guys have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Enjoy this weekend. Don't forget the Richmond Expo is going on this weekend, starting on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you get out, make sure you're safe. Wear a PFD. And as always, remember, 22 a day is 22 too many. Y'all be good.